Good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please turn off or turn to silent your devices? Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 4 and 5 in private this morning? Thank you. Item 2 is post-legislative scrutiny on the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning and thank you very much for coming. The evidence session will take place in a round table format, as you can see, with the aim of encouraging discussion. As usual, MSPs will ask questions of witnesses, but witnesses can also ask questions of each other. We want to retain some structure to the discussion, so please indicate to me or to the clerks, uh, Lucy and Alan, if you would like to make a con if you would like to make a contribution. And when you speak, your microphone will be automatically activated, so there's no need to touch the console. I'm going to ask everyone to go around and introduce themselves. Uh, so my name is Jenny Mara, and I'm convener of this committee. Uh, I'm Calvin Brown. I'm Director of Communications for NHS Lanarkshire. Good morning. Liam Kerr, MSP for North East Region and uh, Deputy Convener of this committee. I'm um, Leanne Jobling, um, Head of Information Government at the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service. Alec Neil, MSP for the Adrian Shorts. Uh, Anne Nishabowski, <coughs> um, Information Compliance Manager at the University of Edinburgh. And Ash Sarwar, MSP for the Glasgow Region. Lucy McKenzie, Senior Customer Experience Officer at Aberdeen City Council. I'm Dr Kenneth Meekin. I'm here representing the Society of Local Authority Lawyers and Administrators in Scotland and also the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives. Colin Beatty, MSP for Midlothian North and Musselburgh. Jackie Buchanan, Director of Legal and Democratic Services at Angus Council. I'm Willie Coffey, MSP for Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley. Uh, good morning, I'm Sheena Brennan, uh, Information Manager for Disclosure for Police Scotland. Uh, Bill Bowman, MSP for the North East Region. Good morning, Graham Forrester. I'm with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Great stuff. Thank you very much. I'm going to open questioning for the committee this morning about the request process. We've had some uh, evidence to say that the request process can be overly complicated or can cause confusion and that there's no standardisation of that across the public sector. Would any of the witnesses like to address those concerns about consistency of that and the request process. Kenneth Meehan. Chair, um, the problem with applying consistency is the fact that the legislation basically says any request for recorded information has to be treated as an FOI request. Um, so while we might ask applicants to come through a standard channel, we can't insist on it. And even if they've come through an alternative channel, so for example, a journalist having a discussion with her press office who subsequently decides he didn't like the answer can say, oh, that was an FY request. I would now like it treated as a review. Um, so it is hard to impose standardization, but we're, we're very happy across sectors to have dialogue with our counterparts to have a standardized suggested approach, but we can't insist on it. Why can't you insist on it? Because it's not in legislation? Or? The legislation requires us to treat any recorded request for information as an FOI request. Yes, OK. Sheena Brennan. Um, in Police Scotland, we have a, a mailbox, a central processing <coughs> unit, uh, which basically all of the requests for FOI, um, specifically requests, should come through that process. Although, obviously, as Kenny said, you know, the requests can come from wherever, uh, especially EIRs. Um, but those requests are um, channeled through a central mailbox uh, accessible through the Police Scotland website. Uh, and we have a, a team, a dedicated team, who will then look at that request, allocate it to a specific area, uh, and they will process it accordingly. Uh, individuals will get an acknowledgement email. Uh, if they require, they will get a, a response accordingly, but the acknowledgement email effectively just tells them that the information will be proce uh, processed within the 20-day timeline uh, and gives them a link um, to that. So, from our point of view, that was the easiest way for Police Scotland to um, ensure that those FOI requests were then processed through that central routing. You touched, uh, Sheena, there on environmental information regulations. You said there's the same request process. Is that right? Do you find there's confusion between the processes for the two? 
Uh, interestingly enough, we don't deal with a lot of EIRs, um, but EIRs can be made, as, as can an FOI, um, through other means. Uh, and I think the, the concern, obviously, with EIRs in particular is that uh, individuals might be making that request verbally um, and how we then channel that request appropriately and have it recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be honest with you, in Police Scotland, we don't deal with that many. Mm -hmm. Graeme Forrester. Because I, <coughs> sorry, I challenge with the, the EIRs. They are a, a slightly different framework within which um, we work. And I'm probably in somewhat a similar position to, uh, to Sheena Brennan. And my organisation deals with some EIRs. But in terms of proportions, we are probably more focused on or deal with more um, FOI requests. But even within the organisation, there are some complexities which are challenging to deal with and that kind of a uh, grey space where potentially an FOI and an EIR could be covering the same sorts of areas. And there is a role, I think, that we have as administrators, as uh, facilitators of the, the process to, to help people through that. Um, and perhaps that's just another example of where the, the, it would be challenging to apply a, a consistency across the piece where you're relying upon individual people within very varying organisations to try to assist any member of the public from um, or from a range of different organisations to make best use of the processes. Okay. So do you think that possibly the request process for FOI and EIR should be aligned? I would think that that would certainly help from our point of view in administra administrating the processes. I think it would be of assistance to the individual applicants as well. I think there would be some challenges in that the, the background that EIRs is is slightly different to FY, and there are some differing requirements within there. So there would need to be some work on how you would align the two systems to ensure that the administrative processes um, could be applied equally. I think in practice, the way in which they're managed and handled within organisations is likely to be very similar. Okay. Would anyone like to comment on that? Calvin Brown. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's probably unlikely that we receive any inquiries at all where people specify e uh, the, the request and EIR. More commonly, we receive inquiries through freedom of information and we realise on receiving them that actually be more appropriately dealt with through EIRs. Um, just to be able to go back to the point about consistency, we've got a web form on our website. About 90% of the inquiries we get do come through the, that web form, which, which does drive consistency of our response. But we're an organisation of 12,000 staff. Clearly, there's potential for inquiries to come in through different routes that don't necessarily get, then get routed in through, um, through the Freedom of Information team. Okay. Any more general comments on the request process? Jackie Buchanan. Yes, thank you. Um, I would agree with Calvin that the vast majority of requests that come in are under FOI. In fact, probably members of the public recognise FOI a lot more easily than they would an EIR. Mm -hmm. and, and I certainly think there would be benefits in having the same system for both. Um, I think in terms of consistency, um, a lot of local authorities now have software uh, to help with a more effective and more efficient system. And that allows a standardised way in which councils deal with um, the applications. I think there can be differences in the process simply because of the requirements of whatever package that councils and, and other public authorities have. Um, but after reading that um, some people that gave evidence before thought there was difficulties in placing FOIs, I'd gone on, and certainly as I as a focus from local authorities to, to see how it worked. And any time I put in the name of a, a council an FOI, it immediately took me to the relevant page. So I, I did find that relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. But I, I do understand that perhaps in terms of each system, there's different requirements in terms of how the process works. Yes. Alec Neil. Oh, sorry, I'm going to bring in Anne first. Uh, uh, simply that um, I think some of the, the, the potential confusion, I think, that, that have been raised in the previous sessions, um, it's for public authorities to help um, uh, people making requests. Uh, people, the, the system is designed so they don't have to know anything about the legislation, whether it's the EIRs or, or, or FOISA, they, they don't have to know. Um, every time somebody asks for a university prospectus, that is a freedom of information request. We just give them the prospectus, though. And, but, so it's for us to try and uh, make sure that we de we're dealing with their request appropriately. Um, they shouldn't have to, to, to worry about it. So. Uh, the idea, you know, we do provide central systems so that they can come through, but um, that's not the, you know, that's not really the way the legislation's um, uh, designed. Thank you. Alec Neil. 
Can I just pick up that point? I, I absolutely agree with you. That's how the legislation is designed, but it doesn't actually always work that way mm -hmm. in practice, uh, particularly where there's a public authority trying to avoid having to answer the question, which is not a rare uh, event. Uh, can I move on to a wider issue? And that is, um, we've had some evidence indicating that there is a problem with organisations such as the joint integration boards, uh, which are kind of betwixt and between, but are not actually listed uh, as a statutory body in terms of FOI, and yet now uh, they're, they're accountable for two-thirds of health board expenditure, for example, and a fair chunk of local authority expenditure. Um, so people tend to... Uh, there's a danger that people get battered around from health board or local authorities uh, to try and answer questions that really should go straight to the IGB. Uh, and there are par parallel issues around things like leisure trusts, like Angus Council have indicated, uh, you know, if somebody wants to do an FOI in the leisure trust, who do the right to the leisure trust or the council? Um, so how do we tackle this issue? Is it a case of, for example, adding the IGBs to the list of organisations that do have to reply directly to FOIs? Uh, uh, should we empower local authorities and health boards, for example, as is suggested, I think, by Solace and others, to be able to refer uh, the FOI to another public body? What, what's the view on that? Because it's, it's frustrating for everybody. I know it's frustrating for the health board uh, and frustrating for the person who's asking for the information. Kenneth Meehan. Thanks, Chair. Um, I should possibly mention my day job. I actually work as head of information for Glasgow City Council. Um, we do have that exact scenario where, um, in terms of our integration with Greater Glasgow Health Board, the team that handle FOI requests for both organisations are co-located. And we have the bizarre scenario where an officer can deal with a request that's been sent into Glasgow City Council, issues a response saying, we don't hold the information, you need to make the request to the Health Board. It gets made to the Health Board and then comes back to that same officer to actually deal with operationally. And the problem we have is that the legislation presently doesn't allow us to transfer it. And we've had scenarios where requests made to the council just after we'd set up one of our arm's length external organisations related to information held by that body. The council at the time dealt with it itself, issued the response, it went to review, went to appeal, and only at that point the commissioner said, actually, they didn't make the request to the body that holds the information. So the commissioner had no jurisdiction. So an attempt to be helpful and transfer a request to another organisation has the inadvertent effect of depriving the applicant of their appeal rights. And we think it would be much more sensible if we could transfer the information. I don't think listing IGBs would be part of a solution, but not very much of a solution for the simple reason that the IGB draws up the integration plan, it then issues directions back to the council and the health board. So almost all the information that people are interested in in terms of the delivery of health and social care services remains being held by either local authority or the health board. The IGB itself holds very little information, so designating IGBs for FY purposes wouldn't actually achieve very much. So are you saying with that, Dr Meehan, that <clears throat> if you're looking for any information about well, what Mr Neil described about spending with under the auspices of the IGB, you're legally entitled to get that information from the health board or the council, or both? Yes. Okay. The, the information in general will be held by one or both of those bodies. Okay, and are you saying about this transfer of request, that would that require a change in the Act to yeah. protect the right of appeal? That would require a change in the legislation, yes. Okay. The transfer mechanism already exists under the EIRs, but not under FY. Do, do any of you have any further comment on what councils or health boards are doing to make that process clearer or easier for the public to access? Because it is quite confusing. Graeme Forrester. Yes, I, th I think the, in practice we do try to help. And I think that is uh, one of the real the functions that we do have to try to explain the situation and how how individuals can best access information they're looking for. I think that's this issue with HSCPs and IGBs is from the health boards and I guess from the council's point of view as well, one of the real opportunities with this, with this process. It's an area where the world has moved on significantly since the FOI Act came into force. 
and this is possibly the best opportunity so far to look just at the detail of how that's functioning and draw some uh, some of the practice from the EIR side into to FY to, to help that kind of seamless access from the, the individual member of the public uh, into information that they, they are entitled to have. Mm -hmm. but, but that seamless access, Graham Forster, I mean, I, I heard clearly what Jackie Buchanan said that you you know, put into your search engine each council an FOI, and it was quite clear. But we've heard quite a lot of evidence that people don't find it that user friendly to try and get information from public authorities. So I'm just interested in more examples what each of your organisations are doing to make that process clearer for people, which would enhance their right of access. Due to that, I mean, Dr. Meehan. I mentioned the co-location between the people handling the local authority and the health board in Glasgow, but the IGB, the, the six IGBs around Greater Glasgow Health Board, presumably in the other five, there isn't co-location. No. So, we are trying to stand, sorry, um, there's no co-location between the separate local authorities. Um, we are trying to standardise a number of things, such as having a common information sharing protocol yep. that would describe the information flows between the health board and the local authorities, and that's a common protocol that will apply across all six local authorities. Graeme Forrester. Yes, yeah, so from the health board's point, we do work alongside in partnership with six local authorities, and there are six IGBs in place, and that by necessity it applies a level of uh, complexity into those relationships but what we do have within the the health board and into the igbs and um, the staff that work through the hscps uh, a joined up system of uh, at least sharing learning we have officers within each of the hscps that we work in partnership with who are responsible for a range of corporate functions which will include fois and eirs but also complaints and some other matters as well to ensure that on a regular basis we bring people together from these organisations to talk about how we do things and to share some of the learning that we've got. In terms of proportion, um, my organisation, the NHS Greater Glasgow Clyde, receive vastly more requests than any of the HSCPs do. Um, and that puts us in a place where it's probably our responsibility to share some of our learning with our partners in these other organisations. And we've got frameworks in place to do so. I think there is a, a, an additional level of complexity when you take a stage further out and there are six councils. We also work regionally, we also work nationally as well. Um, and there are networks within the, the NHS, um, FY lease networks, and also, well, Solar um, will have an opportunity to, to share within the local authority framework as well. Dr Meehan. Yeah, we, the Solar Data Protection Group exists largely to share, Data Protection and FOI Group exists to share best practice in this area. Um, that does involve a degree of um, similarity in approach. It's because we're sharing best practice um, as identified through dealing with it at the sharp end through the appeals process or dealing with the awkward customers who test your systems uh, to the limit. So yeah, we do share best practice. In terms of the public engagement side of it, if I'm being honest, it isn't an area we've explored in a huge amount of detail. Um, that's maybe something we could pick up. Okay. Jackie Buchanan. Um, the point I'd pick up, Convener, was in relation to your request, and I mean, how do we help the public? Um, if, for example, someone wrote in to us and the information was held by the Health Board, we, we would tell them that. Um, and, and certainly, as, as other speakers have said, it would be helpful if we could simply refer it on. But that would require a change in the legislation to do that. Okay. Any other further points on that? Okay. Can I ask then, uh, before we move on, about the issue of um, private companies? This is something that has come up in evidence because many of your organisations will have uh, contracts with private companies who are delivering services for your public organisation, but they are not covered by FOI. Do you think FOI should be extended because public money is being spent on those contracts to give the public that right to the information? Calvin Brown. Uh, uh, yes, uh, certainly from our point of view, we think it should uh, in NHS Lancashire. We've got a specific example where we've got 
three acute hospitals, one of which is um, run by NHS Lanarkshire, but the other two are PFI hospitals. Um, so there are obviously private companies involved there. And sometimes we find when people write in looking for information across all three hospitals, we hold the information in Monklands, but the information on the other two hospitals may be held by the, uh, the PFI consortiums. So there's not all, we're not always able to provide a consistency of information that we would like back. Um, we do have a very good relationship with them. We do have a good information exchange, but there obviously are at times differences in maybe the level and detail of information we provide. So from a public point of view, you would think the expectation would be that you would get that consistent information. They're all public NHS hospitals, so therefore you would expect us to be able to access the same information in relation to each of them. Supplementary in that, because I obviously agree with what he's saying. Um, the, the, the main PFI contractor obviously should hold a lot of, if not all of the information, but sometimes there are big subcontractors. So should the right to know extend to the subcontractors? Uh, I, th I think so, you're right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other points on, do people agree with the ex extension to contracting firms? Um, Kenneth Meehan. Without saying yes or no, um, my experience is that there's actually very limited circumstances in which we have been unable to provide information because we don't hold it ourselves held by a contractor. Uh, some of it will be commercially sensitive information, even if the council holds it, you might be slightly reluctant to disclose it anyway because you potentially damage the commercial interests of your contractor. Mm -hmm. But it's quite unusual for us to actually refuse requests on the basis that we don't have that information. Uh, and there's provision in the Public Records Scotland Act that if a contractor is creating public records on behalf of a, a listed public authority from that legislation, you should make provision to ensure that those records are properly managed in accordance with your records management plan. So we already have provision in there that if it's being managed in terms of your records management plan, it should be accessible under FOI. I mean, I think we heard quite strong evidence from Unison and Glasgow City Council that there were a number of private contracts that Glasgow City Council has where that information is not available. But that doesn't seem to be what you're saying, Dr Mahan. Unison have a particular interest in a number of our contractors. That's not the perception or not the effect for the vast majority of our applicants. Applicants being the people asking for the information? Yes. What do you mean it's not the... Most people, when they ask us for information, um, the vast majority of requests, they're actually given the information that they, they ask for, or most of it, in any case. So you, you don't think that the fact that FOI doesn't expend, pr extend to private contractors is a problem? It restricts the scope of FOI legislation, um, that's true, but it's the extent to which it restricts the scope that I think is perhaps less clear. Okay. Does anyone else have comments on the private contracts that your public organisations have and whether the legislation should extend into them? Jackie, this was quite. This has been quite a hot topic in evidence we have received so yes. far. Jackie in, Buchanan. In terms of it being a particular issue, I'm, I'm not aware of that from personal experience. I would also add to what uh, Dr. Main saying in terms of uh, the requirement to publish information. The, the um, Procurement Reform Scotland Act requires councils to maintain a register of contracts that they have um, and is quite detailed in terms of the specifics. Now, of course, it might not provide all the information that, that an applicant requests, but it does have a framework for that. Mm -hmm. Graham Forrester. I think maybe to pick up on a point that Calvin made, I think it would be difficult to explain to a member of the public why information in relation to one hospital is available and the equivalent information in relation to another hospital is not available. I think that it is, I don't know to what extent that differentiation applies in practice and certainly uh, what Dr. Meekin uh, uh, is saying suggests that it's maybe not quite as, uh, as obvious as may be thought, but I will return to say it, it would be difficult to explain why two different levels of information would be available from two different and to a member of the public similar services. Okay. Bill Bowman. Thank you. If I can turn now to um, the issue of responding to requests for information and I have a couple of points on the timing. Um, we've had 
evidence, written evidence that users find delays in FOI requests is often received on or after the, the deadline. And also that sometimes authorities use the 20 day limit as um, you know, a time limit, even if the information is ready, readily available on, on day one. So uh, uh, we can ask for your comments on that and, and sort of linked to that, we've also had suggestions that the deadline for responses might be delayed in certain um, specific cases. And in previous session, um, we had evidence from Dr. Ben Worthy, who spoke of what he described as an anchoring effect, where basically people work to a deadline. And if you extend the deadline in some cases, that will just become the limit that they, that they work to. Uh, I wonder if you have comments on, on that. Sheena Brennan. The legislation, obviously 20 working days uh, is what we are aiming for and in terms of the compliance and the reporting that we do to the Office of the Information Commissioner, um, obviously the performance uh, regime is very much in their mind uh, and it's classed as a failure to respond. If we don't respond within the 21 days, like many other organisations, we are very um, uh, keen on uh, close performance monitoring uh, and it, we have been criticised before by the Commissioner uh, who has a specific grading in relation to our compliance rates um, and we have managed to improve our compliance rates quite substantially over the past three quarters. I think in relation to certainly the processing of requests, um, the aim is obviously to get the information out within 20 days. Um, there will be certain, certain circumstances where it just isn't feasible. I think the important thing from an applicant's point of view is to make sure that they are aware of the potential delays or you know, the fact that we might not be able to give them the information. We have had discussions with the Commissioner's Office previously in relation to sometimes you're able to give a partial response uh, within the time scale. You know, would that help uh, an, an applicant? Fundamentally, the, the Act talks about failure to respond and 20, 20 working days is their um, key element. Um, but certainly, I would say, certainly from a Police Scotland point of view, um, we are very much aiming to get that information out within 21, uh, 20 working days and keep our performance rates up. Graham Forrester. I would just want to to reassure the committee, from my organisation's point of view, our FOI performance is a, a performance measure that's dealt with at a board level. On a bi-monthly basis, our board take our FOI performance into consideration along with all the other performance measures which are applied to the health board. And I, I can say that there is significant challenge on our performance there. Um, so in line you know, with the, the performance management which we do on a more operational basis and submit to the, the information commissioner. We also, within our own organisations, I think are pretty strong in ensuring that we report on performance and demonstrate what actions we're going to take where there are performance challenges. So how often do you respond within less than 20 days? We, at the moment, um, I think we're around about 90% of our applications are dealt with fully within that uh, within the, the 20 working day period. Well, less than 10 days? I don't have the data on less than 10 days at the moment. We do collate that. Um, I don't have it in front of me. Um, I think there is, a, there is an intention within organisations to provide information when it is available. I do recognise that we have a prevalence of responses <coughs> being issued around the 18, 19, 20 day mark. I don't think we can escape that uh, that point. Um, so you are working to the 20-day deadline, effectively? In practice, the, the majority of our requests are responded to around the 18, 19, 20-day mark. But we do maintain uh, a view on what we can put out earlier. OK. Lucy McKenzie. Um, I, I would like to just point out that um, organisations are in challenging situation with regards to uh, delivering services and I think naturally people do you know if a deadline's given to them they do naturally you know go by that deadline but wherever possible we do encourage early responses uh, within Aberdeen we're also around 90 percent of, of performance within the 20 days and um, there are complex inquiries that come in at uh, requests which may involve 60 schools all all 
providing towards a response and then there's a, an aspect of quality assurance that comes afterwards and approval from the relevant officers so it can take up to 20 days and on some occasions over. It, okay. it depends on the complexity of the request. Can I read you a little bit of evidence that we received on this. Uh, Claire Cairns from the Coalition of Carers said that she had put in 32 identical requests to every local authority in Scotland and 14 of those responses were received late. Why is that, councils? Anyone from a council want to comment on that? Kenneth Meehan. Um, I'm not familiar with what the actual request was. Uh, very often, Deadlines are missed simply because requests can be made through any channel at all and you're therefore dependent on any single member of staff being able to recognise that what they've got is an FY request and route it through the appropriate team. Um, I do know that FY teams regularly receive requests quite late into the 20 day timescale so before we can even start working on it you've already lost a significant amount of time. Okay. But we've also heard from journalists that just before the 20 day limit, they get an email from public authorities asking for clarification on the FOI. Why would that request for clarification be sent just before the 20 day limit? Why wouldn't it be sent within three, five, ten days? Do, do any of you have experience of going back to applicants requesting clarification on their request? Lucy McKenzie, Aberdeen Council. It, it, it could be down to, again, the number of services that are involved in responding to the request. Sometimes it, it might be further into the process before it's identified who a request needs to go to. So it may be that that service don't receive it until later on, and at that point they then have questions. Again, without knowing the circumstances, it is difficult to comment. So how many of your responses from Aberdeen City Council are late over the 20 days? Um, we're, overall, its uh, performance is quite consistent. Around 90% are, are responses are provided within the 20 working days. So about 10% would be late? Approximately. It's, it's round about that. Okay. Leanne Jobling, you're from the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that we, um, we, um, we are a central unit, a bit like um, Sheena um, said, um, and we do try to um, identify if clarifications need to be done within kind of like five working days so that we can um, respond within the, um, the time limits. Um, we do have a, I mean, in 2018, we had a 92.5 response rate on time. So obviously 7.5% of ours um, were late. That's not just, um, th that's for a number um, of reasons, but we do try to, you know, we do try to respond either um, within the 20 working days or earlier um, than that where um, possible. But we, um, as an organisation, um, like many, have multiple um, multiple sites. We're, a, we're an organisation that has um, 39 um, sheriff courts and if we're having to bring that information in, if it's not centrally located, that can take time um, to bring together. So what's your hit rate in terms of the 20 day period? I think uh, uh, Lucy McKenzie said Aberdeen's is 90% of responses are answered. Yeah, so um, I've only got um, numbers from our first two quarters of this year where we've hit a 91% response rate, but in 2018 we were 92.5. Um, so we're, you know, we're in the um, ICO's kind of upper compliance where we're doing quite well between 90 and 95% overall. So you'd be about the same as Aberdeen, that 10% yeah. of yours are late and 90% are answered within 20 days? Around that, yeah. Calvin Brown, do you know what your hit rate is? Historically, we've been above 90%. We have had some short-term challenges this year where we have dipped in some months below 80%, um, but that we expect that to come back up again. Um, we're taking measures to address that, but yeah, historically, we've been above 90 Willie Coffey. Is there a distinction between the information that you actually have to hand and information that's being requested that you have to derive? Uh, I presume that there could be an issue in delivering that information if you don't have it, if a, if a member of the public is looking for a bit of information that requires a little bit of research. So do you distinguish between the two types of request and your performance in relation to those? Sheena Brennan, Police Scotland, did you want to answer that? Just to sort of give you a, a sort of flavour, we've actually improved our, our compliance from 81% in quarter one this year to 91% in quarter three. And what we've actually done is 
We've triaged our what we class as basics. So that very scenario where you can then look at it and say, right, I, I've actually got individuals identified to triage those basics, to get them out as quickly as possible, to get them off the list effectively, to say, right, OK, there's an easy answer. There's one that's actually an exemption under personal data. There's one which is actually information already held elsewhere. You can point to that. There's information that we wouldn't be able to give you because we don't have it. So if we can process those from an applicant's point of view, we're getting a better return rate. It then means that when the harder questions, where you then have to then source that information, um, um, like the others have said, where you might look at it and say, right, OK, well, I think that's kept within our statistics team, or I think that's kept within our um, operational teams. You've sourced other sort of information elsewhere. Then a couple of days later, they come back and say, that's not mine. It might be there. So some of them are just much more difficult to then actually source the information. Now, in relation to the clarification at last minute, that's nothing, that's not something we would ever want to do. But sometimes because of the nature of the request and the routing that it's actually taken, you might get certain pieces of information back you look at it and you look at the question and you think, I can't do this. We need to go back and say, for the advice and assistance, could we then perhaps vary the request? This is what we've got. Is there something else we could do? And that's where sometimes it is that last minute um, before we've actually sourced all the information. Calvin Brown. Yeah. I suppose it's one thing that's probably important to mention is that as well as looking at just the response rate and the percentage um, that we respond to within the 20 working days, there is also quality control as well because sometimes you could get responses out quicker, um, but if you want to be absolutely sure you've got the full information, you take a bit more time with it. So there's plenty of examples where we have deliberately taken a bit longer with an inquiry just to be absolutely sure we've got the response right and we've got the complete information. And so we measure ourselves against also the amount of review requests we get back, and we try to keep these to an absolute minimum. If you, you we could have a higher response rate, but have a higher review rate. Kenneth Meehan, you have an overview of all local authorities, all councils in Scotland. Is 90% sure. around the, the rate that the, councils are answering requests? That seems to be uh, round about the standard level. There is some variation around there. I, I'm not aware of any councils reporting significantly below 90%. Some of them, um, Glasgow, for example, this financial year, we're currently reporting 98% compliance, which is our best ever. Um, so the evidence we got from Claire Cairns that 14 out of 32 were late, you would say that's an exception? I would say it's an exception. I'd, I'd say I don't know what the request was actually in relation to. If it's a particularly complicated request and it does require pulling information from multiple sources, then it will take longer. Um, in response to your point about if you have to do additional work on it, there comes a point where if you have to keep doing so much work on it that you would turn around and say, we don't actually hold the information that you're requesting. We're not required to create new information. We are required to assemble it in a way that the applicant would like um, to an extent, but not to the extent of actually creating new information. I'm just, sorry, forgive me, I'm struggling a wee bit that everyone's performing so well because the other evidence we got was from Professor Kevin Dunyon, who's previous information commissioner, you'll know him, and he said that failure to respond accounts for a quarter of all appeals to the Scottish Information Commission. That doesn't really tally with a hit rate across the public sector of 90%. In some respect, sir Chair. Uh, in some respects, it does simply because if you look at the number of requests made into any given sector, if you take the local authority sector, the total number of requests is running into the tens of thousands, as opposed to the number of appeals taken to the commissioner, which is you know, dozens, I think, for local authorities. So it's a small, small percentage of cases that actually go to appeal to the commissioner, which is what Mr. Uh, Professor Dunyan would be reporting on. So the ones that are going to the commissioner are not representative they are the ones where something has gone wrong and if there has been a failure to respond then obviously the applicant is going to want to have something done about that. Okay. Do any of you feel you need longer than 20 days? Police Scotland smiling. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Graham Forrester from... The guard... Sorry. On you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks, Chair. The guard... A couple of ideas in my mind. Yeah, there's a, a differentiation <coughs> between the time scales which are applied for the EIRs and for FOI. I don't think that I would 
want us to go to a place where we would be looking at 40 days to reply to an FOI request. I think it's been referred to... But, yeah. I think it's been referred to as, a, as an anchoring effect that if you apply a time scale, it is likely that people will respond around that time scale. One of the, the matters for me which is quite prevalent is freedom of information is about building trust. It's about openness and transparency in public authorities. And I would hope that after 15 or so years of the Act being in place, we are getting towards a place where we have more trust. People have more trust in public authorities. I'm not certain that comes across in the evidence that's been presented to the committee. So I wouldn't want us to look at extending the time scale. I think that sends the wrong message as a blanket extension. But I think there is scope to say that where there are particularly challenging requests and perhaps where there's interaction between local authorities and health boards and IJBs, there is a level of complexity there which would justify on a case-by-case -case basis okay. a slight extension. And I suppose I fall back on it's, it's better to provide information in 21 days or 22 days and it to be right and useful than to not provide at all. Okay. Thank you. Um, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, sticking with this uh, business of responding, a number of the uh, responses we've received raise resource issues, um, so staffing uh, in particular. So, for example, NHS Lanarkshire say that the requests are up four times, but the resources uh, have not been increased four times. And the statistics that we've seen say seem to suggest that uh, the requests are at a record high. So, if the staff resource is not there, what action can you take and is being taken to address uh, to, to, to meet the timescales given a, a, a lacking resource. Lucy Mackenzie, Aberdeen Council. I think as Jackie touched on, you know, organisations were looking at software and systems that can help us to um, streamline the process and automate where we can, for example, um, the d previous disclosures as well, so that uh, applicants have access to see what previous responses have gone out and, and they can get the information immediately uh, and um, going digitally where possible to, to try and, and make the process more efficient. Kenneth Meehan. Sure. Um, yeah, again, it's a sharing of best practice there as well. Um, if you don't have a technology solution, there is good practice in terms of fast triage, for example, of the easy requests so that they're not sitting waiting in a queue behind something that's very complicated and is going to take a lot longer to do. Um, but if I could go back to the previous point in terms of the extension of timescales. Um, there's three main regimes for accessing information in Scotland. We have Freedom of Information Scotland Act, we've got the Environmental Information Regulations, and we've got subject access rights under data protection legislation. FOI is the only one that doesn't actually have an extension provision in it. Um, and so we would argue that it would, there is scope for these particularly complicated ones to have provision akin to under EIRs or data protection, where within the original 20 days, you say to the applicant, we're not going to be able to make the 20 days, it will take a bit longer. In terms of the anchoring effect that uh, Ben Wardley referred to, having this two-stage process where you have to send out a reminder means that people are not working to a 40-day timescale. Our experience is that very, very few requests under data protection or under the EIRs actually utilise the extension provisions. So I don't think if we were to legislate for that kind of provision, I don't see that that would actually increase the average response times in any way. It would be the ones that were presently not turning around within 20 days would continue to be processed in the same time scale, but this way we'd at least be complying with legislation in doing so. Thank you. Sheena Brennan. Um, I would just maybe agree with um, Kenny there in relation to the ones that have just gone late. You know, we did a, an exercise just the other day and we looked at the ones which were maybe just one or two days over the timescale and I think that's where the highest proportion ones. It's the ones that really take a long, longer time and resources which might then, if you could extend it to maybe match up with GP and go for 30 days, um, you would still be looking at triaging and making sure that the quick wins were actually able to be processed quickly. And that's what you can do. And I, I, going back to the resources, you know, we, we are quite a few years down the line in relation to this legislation. I think we're 
more um, culturally aware and we're publishing more. And we certainly, just in May there, we started publishing our multi-member ward stats back to 13, 14. And that has been a great assistance to ourselves because we can then push those requests to the publish, publish information, point them uh, to individuals, and that gives a, a quicker sort of win. So I think if we can, there's tweaks that we can do to actually assist because we don't have the resources, we don't have um, any additional information. Most of our teams are actually working with DP as well. So obviously the impact of the, the new legislation last year has been substantial. So we are struggling. So it's everything that we do as we go along to then say, right, okay, what's the best for us, but what's the best for the applicants as well? Okay, thank you. Calvin Brown, NHS Lanarkshire. Yeah, thanks. And just in terms of addressing that resourcing issue, some of the things that we've done in Lanarkshire is a couple of years ago, we held an organisation-wide review of FY, how we managed it. Um, out of that, we had an action plan that included extra trading for staff, raising awareness across the organisation. Um, we're working on an electronic learning module that will go out through through the NHS, not just in, in NHS Lanarkshire and FOI as well. Uh, we have also focused on increased publication. We've noticed that our, we, we can analyse and there's particular areas where we're getting a high volume of requests. One was um, pharmacy applications. Um, so we've proactively publish more information about that now, which has reduced the number of uh, requests coming in. Uh, I suppose there is an element of it that is unmanageable, and that's that some, uh, the, some of the information needs to be provided by clinicians, um, and there's no route around the fact that they have to take time away from their day job to source that information and get it back to us. So there's not an easy answer to that resourcing bit of the question. Thank you for that. It's interesting you're talking about dealing with some of this mm. in terms of then resorting to proactive publication. We're going to come on to that. Jackie Buchanan and then Liam Kerr. In terms of our response, we'd mentioned the fact that um, FOIs can come in from anywhere and it may be helpful to have a dedicated channel um, in terms of the legislation so that they come in in a set way. I, I know that that has um, dangers in itself in terms of perhaps not allowing some requests to come through, but in terms of efficiency, I think that would help. Liam Kerr. Now, sticking with responding, there is obviously a, a cost attached uh, or a, a cost that can be levied uh, to uh, offset the, the, the resource costs. So uh, currently it's limited to £600, uh, £15 an hour. And a number of the submissions we've received suggest that uh, there should be a review of the charging of fees. So is your view that the fees need to be increased or is, is it a case that more could be done on efficiencies to strip cost out of the system? Anyone? Kenneth Meehan. The current fees regulations are such that very few organisations bother charging a fee. Um, there's a pragmatic basis there that by the time you've worked out how much it's going to cost in terms of the fees regulations. You've applied the £15 an hour cap to it and the 90% disregard. The absolute maximum fee you can ever charge is £50, which is roughly how much it costs most organisations to process an invoice. So the fees regulations are effectively um, pointless. And does that need reviewed then? Does that, if they're pointless, do, ought there to be a, a different regime put in place that would allow hard-pressed local councils, for example, to recover some of the cost? Yeah, the fees regulations under the EIRs allow for effectively full cost recovery. Um, again, it's not a provision that many local authorities utilise on a regular basis, but it's useful that it is there um, in the event that you are getting requests that quite clearly seem to be commercially motivated, as a number of them are. Um, so why not you would want to look at having a differentiated fees model depending on the commercialisation or otherwise of the request coming in. Um, I don't think many of us want to be in the business of charging the ordinary member of the public who's asking for something of local significance to them. Um, what we would be more interested in looking at is the amount of time that you require to devote to a request before you're actually allowed to say, no, that's too much. At the moment, the calculation equates to 40 hours of work. So that is over an hour's, a week's work for a member of staff. So one applicant's one question can take out a member of your staff for over a week. And you just have to comply with that. You have no option but to comply with that. The staffing resource implications at the moment are probably unsustainable. Uh, as one of my colleagues mentioned, the teams that are dealing with this are also the teams that are dealing with the significantly enhanced workload associated with the implementation of GDPR. And it is getting to the point where we are 
really struggling. Liam, do you have anything further on that? Anyone further comments on that? Anna Sarwar. Oh, sorry. I was going to add that there is obviously a, a difference between FOISA and FOI down south in relation to the cost levels, and I think that is worth, I think I, I was mentioned by a number of people, and I think certainly if we were looking at that, it should be uh, noted that it is a, a different level. Thank you. Just to develop that point, because that's quite... So down south, it's £450 <laughs> cap, I think. Yes, I don't think I've got it in front of me, but yes, it's definitely, it's, it's higher down south. So I think theirs is... Um, yeah, uh, 600 cap to £25 per hour, uh, and we're at £15 per hour. Mm -hmm. OK. And ask Sarwar. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of the evidence we've had in the other sessions um, have been around people feeling there's an inconsistency in terms of how responses are made depending on who is making the application <laughs> of an FOI, for example, journalists or MSPs or other politicians, um, feeling as if their responses are treated differently because of of who they are. Do you, do you accept that? And if not, um, what's, the, what's your explanation? Graham Forrester. I think in terms of practice, what we do is we have a, a core team. I have three members of staff whose core responsibility is processing freedom of information requests and EIRs as well. Um, we do attempt to direct as many, as many requests as possible directly to them. We make contact details uh, available for them. And we have, as part of our uh, regular training for all, me all members of staff, some basic guidance around FY and forwarding on requests to this core team. Part of the function of doing it in that manner is all of the applicant details are stripped out of the request at that stage. We have a, a staffing 40,000 people. We access information from the whole range of services that my organisation provide. When we go to individual departments to ask for information, they don't see any details about who is asking. They receive a, a bare request for a set of information. Um, I suppose over time, if there are regular requests from the same people, directed into the same area, you would pick up some consistencies in the way that information is asked for. But we do attempt, where at all possible, to be entirely applicant blind. And when we as a, my team are asking for the information, which they will then collate, the people who are providing that information do not know from whom the request has been received. I've got a follow-up to that, but if anyone else wants to answer the, the general point first. Sheena Brennan. I would certainly support what Graham's saying. It's applicant and purpose blind. The request goes out with no further information um, to the business area. Um, there's no other information shared elsewhere. It's only for my team to know who that applicant is. So I would totally support that, you know, there is no differentiation between whoever. Certainly, there will be some individuals who will send in a number of requests along maybe a same topic. We might not want to class them as vexatious. Some of them are more complicated, but certainly all of our requests are applicant and purpose blind. Kenneth Meehan. I think, Chair, that's, that's fairly standard practice now, is that the request for information going out to the information holders generally has been anonymised, and we don't actually identify who the request's from. So there is no scope for treating it differently. Okay. The only change, that mo the only subtle distinction that most organisations make is if it's a journalist's inquiry, you will let your press office know. That's not that you're running the request past your press office for prior clearance or anything along those lines. Simply so that the press office, when they get the follow-up inquiry, as inevitably does happen, actually know what it was that the journalist was provided with that they're following up on. So, so just to come back to that. It I accept, OK, you, you probably anonymise or don't share who the application is from when you're gathering the information. But in terms of a sign-off process and then response process, so one is the data gathering part, but one is once you've gathered the data and you've compiled the response and the sign-off process for it going back out, any difference there at all? Because I don't think any journalist or most MSPs would believe you if, if you said no. Anyone that from puts me in quite a difficult position, I think. We, I couldn't assure you that there, are, there ha have been no occasions, and there was significant investigation work done by the, the SIC. Uh, 
uh, sorry, Scottish the, information, the, the Scottish Commission, Information sorry, Commissioner, right. within the last number of years into uh, well into the Scottish Government. Um, so I, it wouldn't be right for me to sit here and assure you that everything is rosy. What we can put in place, I think, are systems which protect the processes that people put applications into. And I think you make a fair distinction there. There is a, an information gathering stage and there is a, a, a collation and issuing stage, perhaps, um, in that. Can you, can you explain that sign-off process? What we do Could you explain my, the gathering process? People have explained the gathering. Explain the sign-off process in terms of response. We don't apply a sign-off process as such. What we would usually do, um, given the variety of sources of information which we have in quite complex clinical environments, there is a kind of quality assurance check is usually carried out. Um, to give a, a recent example, we received a request for information about. I'll say numbers of clinical procedures. I don't recall now exactly what it was. That was passed to part of our organisation we refer to as Business Intelligence, who collates statistics and data on a vast range of different processes that we carry out clinically and otherwise. The information that came back from them was actually a link to the NHS Information Services Division, which collates nationally uh, data on performance and other matters within the NHS. And the reasoning behind that, in part, was there is a degree of comparability across the nation, degree of comparability across hospital sites within that type of information. We also had other information, which we made available to the individual, which was localised. But there was a bit of sense check put in there, so there was an explanation that went along with two sets of data in response to the same so, question. Sorry for interrupting you, Graham. So once you get a request in from a journalist or MSP, so I've sent hundreds, if not thousands, of FOIs into Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. You've probably had to respond to them, so I apologise uh, for that. But once you get that FOI request, who, who, do you, who do you tell, who do you share that with before the response goes back out? Out with your own office and, and, um, and the, work, the workforce within the FOI uh, workspace? If there was a, a press-related request, we would provide notice of that to our press team so they're aware of what's been And would you share the response with them before you send it back out, just so, so they know that this is what we're sharing? Yes, and they are keen often, if we're about to put some information into the public domain, yep. which might be difficult, might be challenging, that they're aware that they will want to prepare lines for if they're... Will questions. they ever say, give us another couple of days? I've never held anything back on the basis that somebody's asked for extra days or to time. Or, or amended it or changed it indeed Requ I, requested how you how you how it's said how it's framed it, what might go into it actually give us a bit more time never been said i i'm not aware of ever uh, applying extra time or changing the the information which has been given um on that basis. can everyone say that Certainly in the approval process, my, my issues are more in relation to the, sub, the actual subject matter as opposed to who the actual applicant is. So if there's perhaps a subject, as you say, uh, Graham, it's perhaps more challenging, that's where you then alert certain people to this is what we're putting out because it's the case officers who make the decision and they'll have the actual knowledge of the actual act. But there will be business areas who have a knowledge more of the potential sensitivity of the topic um, and I'm thinking of certain, you know, there will be ones which are more challenging, but we are not in the business of um, putting on more time because, to be quite honest with you, our performance is more key from our point of view and getting that response back to the applicants. So it's, yes, there will be individuals who will have interest in this and there will be certain senior staff who will want to sign something off, but it's for us to then prepare that response to make sure that we've given out the right information, we've applied whatever relevant exemptions um, because our aim is to actually give them information. And, and those applicants. senior staff that want to sign it off, will they take more interest in an FOI that comes from a journalist or a politician than It'll elsewhere? Be more, uh, in my experience, and the sign off, have they ever suggested amendments? They might offer more context. And that's where the business area comes into it, because the business area will know the nature of the topic. So there will be certain information where we're looking at the 
bland information we've been given. We've then got the exemptions, but certainly some of the explanation or the context in relation to, well, this is what you do with, um, I can't even think of an example, maybe firearms, you know, this is how we um, uh, staff our officers, this is how we train our officers. So there will be much more context that we can actually gain from the business area because they are the knowledgeable individuals for that. But the focus is on a bit complying with the legislation because that's our regulated response. What about local authorities? Uh, Gina, the sensitivity or the escalation is much more related to the subject matter of the request rather than the identity of the applicant. Um, there will be some subject matters which are known to be sensitive that will be discussed with senior officers in terms of reaching a decision. The FOI team themselves won't know what's sensitive in the sense of will this be damaging or harmful if we release the information we rely, and I'm pretty sure this is true across all sectors, you rely on the information holder being able to identify the potential sensitivity. Your FOI team then take that response and deal with it. Um, but generally, if there were any suggestion that somebody was trying to do that, we all have independent internal review processes, um, and I'm certainly not aware of anyone trying to interfere with an internal review process. The internal review process should be able to say, we hear what you're saying, that you don't want this information going out, but there is no legitimate FOI basis for withholding the information, so out it goes. Any suggestion of ever being asked for more time or amendments? Uh, amendments usually of the contextualisation variety. Um, you know, this is the answer to the question, but presented boldly without surrounding context, it would actually be misleading. So you're not doing either your own organisation or the applicant <coughs> any favours, just releasing the bold information without putting it in a context. Is that the same for everyone else? Yeah, um, Carl <coughs> Brown. Yeah, we have a standard sign-off process so that um, any inquiry that relates to a director's area of responsibility will be ultimately signed off by them or a, or a nominated individual. Um, there will be certain inquiries that will go through myself for, for sense checking. Um, for example, MSP inquiries would, would be included in that. Uh, and that's usually because I've got a greater awareness of the context and maybe some background information. So the amendments we would make at that stage would be similar to other areas. We would, would add additional context because we feel the while the response might comply with the requirements of the legislation, it doesn't tell the full story. So that's what I'm likely to request uh, an amendment to put in additional context and information. That's great. For those that get inquiries from MSPs, do you ever think, why don't they just ask the Minister these questions, why are they sending them to us? Would anyone like to answer that question? Okay, can I have a Silence quick follow-up on that? Graham Forrester, you said that if a press request comes in to you, you refer it to the press team. How do you define a press request? In, by the who has presented it to us. Um, it is probably <clears throat> almost as straightforward as recognising the names of journalists or email addresses are used to submit. Um, so it's just journalists that you refer to the press team? I suppose my question is, do you, are there other categories of people that you consider a press request? Like, would MSPs fall into that category? Or other councillors, other elected politicians? No, I, I think we... We have a relationship um, as an organisation with the press, and I think we, we are, we've had a request, and as I say, it's usually identifiable, primarily in the means that when it comes in as an email to the FOI inbox, it is from at uh, guardian.co.uk. I think I'm just trying to clarify which requests you refer to your press team. Is it just journalists, or is it journalists and politicians? We would only provide notice of something going out to a, a member of the press so that they can be, so that our press team can be prepared if there are follow-up questions from it. Okay, so if, like Mr Sarwar said, if he put in a request to you, you wouldn't refer it to the press team, it would just go straight back to him without that referral? Yes, they would be dealt with. Okay. Um, because Lanarkshire, you just said that if requests come in from politicians, they are referred to you as a senior person. Yeah. Um, can I? Yes, Calvin so, Brown. So, sorry, just to clarify, in, in, in Lanarkshire, the freedom of information function is managed within our communications department. Um, so we manage um, freedom of information requests, obviously media inquiries. We also manage MSP inquiries as well on behalf of the organisation. So by default, we have oversight of all of them. Okay, Colin Beattie. Thank you. Uh, 
We've been talking about exemptions, and I'd like to maybe explore that a wee bit further. Um, obviously, uh, a Scottish Public Authority can withhold information uh, in response to a request if it falls under one of the exemptions detailed in the Act. So I guess the, the most common would be it has to comply with the public interest test. But there's written evidence that suggests that the exemptions available under freedom of information are sometimes applied too broadly, particularly in areas of uh, commercial confidentiality. And uh, examples have been given, for example, queries about PPP, PFI, uh, contracts and so forth. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Kenneth Mayan. Chair, um, I don't think, in the local authority sector, I don't think we're over-applying the exemptions. Um, the one that mostly gets criticised is the Section 30 exemption for um, effective conduct of public affairs. Certainly the advice I give is that that's your exemption of last resort. Um, there is a requirement for a private thinking space. Um, applied properly, Section 30 is absolutely fine, um, just as long as you don't get carried away with it. Just because you're having an internal discussion doesn't make that discussion exempt. Just because something involves a commercial negotiation doesn't mean it's commercially sensitive either. Um, we've certainly done a piece of work in terms of looking at the commercial exemption from the perspective of competition law. And our, our main concern isn't, is it a number? It's, would that number have the effect of distorting future competition when we go back to retender it? So it's, it's taking a slightly more refined approach to it. Um, certainly, we haven't felt any particularly adverse consequences on occasions when we have applied exemptions and the Commissioner has overruled us. We don't see an ad adverse consequence from that. Um, so, okay. But I don't think we apply other than the personal data exemption. <coughs> But um, if, there's a, if there's a perception out there that it's being applied, that uh, the exemptions are being applied too broadly, would you agree with that or not? Anne. Um, certainly at the uh, University of Edinburgh, um, we only uh, uh, ever apply exemptions um, where they meet the tests, and it's legitimate to do so. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, working with colleagues to uh, to understand their concerns, if there's concerns about disclosure, um, and uh, you know, say, well, I'm afraid that doesn't meet the test, so you know, it's got to go out. So, I, I certainly in my experience, um, uh, that's not the case. Calvin Brown, and then Lucy McKenzie. Yes, certainly I would say from NHS Lancer's point of view, we don't like applying exemptions. And if a service will come back to us when we seek information saying, oh, this is exempt, we'll not take that at face value. We'll ask to see the information to make our own judgment on it. Um, and we'll challenge that. And we always feel we need to be in a firm position, should we be reviewed in that request, that we know it was legitimate to have applied that exemption. Lucy McKenzie. Um, I would e echo uh, that viewpoint um, in that I don't think it is over applied. We do have a robust process in place around the um, use of exemptions. Some feedback that we did have was around section 30, which we think it might be helpful to have further guidance around that, um, as it, the exemption can cover a wide variety of things, um, which means that there is possibility that it could on some occasions be applied incorrectly, potentially. Um, so if the wording could be amended or further explanation, that could be helpful. Sheena Brennan, Police Scotland. I mean, certainly, as, as the others have said, you know, when we gather in the information that's for the business area to then evidence any harm, for then us to then assess as case officers, you know, with the uh, knowledge to see whether an exemption is applicable, um, to withhold the information. But the spirit and principle of the Act is to um, provide the relevant information if we have it held. I think when we've then got um, an individual who's concerned about the exemption that might have been applied to withholding the information, they then have the right of review, um, which then is an independent assessment thereafter um, of the request from start to finish, uh, start to uh, finish to then say, right, OK, what exactly um, have we dealt with here? They then have the subsequent um, potential to appeal to the Commissioner's Office. And I think we've all, where we've had decisions where the Commissioner's Office has perhaps not supported the, our use of the exemptions, it's for them, for us to learn, right, OK, well, that didn't actually match. And then we, it's a, it's a learning process. And we have all, over the past 15 years or so, um, certainly perhaps um, learned and varied our position on certain exemptions. But um, I, I wouldn't say that we're overly using. 
a feel for the percentage of FOIs that fall under exemptions? Just a ballpark. No. no. Colin, do you any further questions on this? Uh, no. Sure. Okay. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could look at the issue about um, record keeping and proactive publication of information. You, the panel will probably be aware that issues have been raised uh, during our consideration to this matter about failure, perhaps, of government to, to record and to keep minutes of, and so on and decisions and so on and so forth. There's been a number of examples presented to the committee and concerns about that. Now, we know that the Act doesn't require uh, information to be recorded or even created, as Dr Beaton said. But generally, what are your views on, on this particular issue? Should we, are we recording and keeping the correct type of information that we think the public would like to see? Or could we be doing more to improve this? Jackie Buchanan, Angus Council. Um, I, I think it's a difficult one to, to, to legislate on in terms of compelling authorities to keep information. Um, in relation to how, how you would actually frame that. I, I think it should be borne in mind that for local authorities, um, for committees and, and subcommittees and for the council, all the meetings require to, to have um, the, the papers for them initially published and in turn minutes for, for those meetings. And that tends to be where um, you know, more, the more significant decisions are taken. So they, they in effect should already have a process and, uh, and indeed have a requirement to record um, the decisions and, and, and the information relating to them. Liam Kerr had a supplementary on this point. Yeah, thank you, Convener. It's just a very brief one following on from Colin Beatty's question. Uh, so the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, I think, have a, 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 a very unique situation involving exemptions whereby uh, you, you are not required Leanne Jobling to release records uh, until they're 15 years old and after that there becomes a consideration yeah. um, as to whether they need to be released or not. Could you describe the situation to us and talk about whether 15 years is, is suitable or whether that needs to be reviewed? Yeah, so previously, um, so Uniqueness section 37 applies to the Scottish Court Tribunal Service in terms of court records are exempt. Um, and previously it used to be 30 years and it's been reduced to 15. I'm not quite sure whether 30 years makes how much difference that makes, but um, once the, that exemption falls, um, certainly all the, most of the records that we hold by the nature um, are either criminal or civil um, cases, um, court proceedings, and um, once the, that exemption falls, we then have to look at the Section 38 exemption. And what we're um, finding is, um, and it comes back to the um, Section 12 in terms of costs as well, um, we have to do a quite um, lengthy assessment on whether court records can be released in terms of the personal data that is um, contained within um, the court records. And um, doing that assessment isn't actually covered within the cost um, requirements in terms of us looking to see whether people are um, deceased or not, um, looking at what can and cannot be um, released. Um, the cost of doing a redaction um, is um, included in the cost, but actually that process of actually looking at all of the, um, especially in a, um, say, a um, high court case with witnesses <coughs> um, and, the, and the victims and all the information that's in it, um, once we decide what can be um, most of it, personal data has to be exempt. In actual fact, <coughs> we actually apply the exemption to the redaction, the actual record in itself, is it actually worth putting into the public um, domain? And we have that in terms of actually, is it is it useful um, to put it in the public domain? Um, the cost involved for our staff, our staff, because it's not covered. And um, yeah. And, and what would be the solution to that very briefly? Um, I mean, is it I'm not necessarily thing, sure it's it? about um, increasing I did put, I, I put two options in um, our submission paper about either uh, we could look at the um, exemption period or actually look at um, including for uniqueness in our situation what we could include in terms of the cost. Okay, thank you. Coffee. 
I thanks Jenny. Just to come back to, to that issue about what should and shouldn't be recorded, it, it, it certainly was raised a number of times with this. For organisations that, that already do have minutes and agendas and so on and so forth, you would expect that to be made available through FOI, but for some organisations or departments that don't routinely have minutes and records of meetings and decisions and so on, do you think that should become a requirement in the Act to, to enable that, or should somehow that sit alongside the Freedom of Information Act to, to enable the public to gain access to that kind of information? Kenneth Mayhem. Chair, I think most organisations where we've identified that you don't have formal minutes of meetings, it's mostly, I think, driven by the fact that none of us have got an admin resource to take formal minutes anymore, so you're reduced to doing an action note at the end of the meeting. Um, and I'm facing that scenario myself, with a lot of an admin resource recently. It's not because I'm trying to hide anything, it's simply because we don't have the time and luxury to do full-blown minutes for anything other than the formal meetings of full council committees and subcommittees. Um, back to the point on proactive publication, um, and there's two types of proactive publication. There's, here's our stats of the type that we describe, the, the health board describe, um, where you've identified that you have a, a set of information you want to make it public, which is great. Um, again, it's something that a lot of us don't have a resource to do as much of it as we would like to do it. Um, the other type is where you go for proactive publication in response to the FY campaign. Um, and it's something that has been done in Glasgow and Edinburgh City Council very successfully, where you've had an issue that is obviously a public controversy and you managed to forestall the flood of FOI requests simply by saying, here's all the information that we've got, we're going to put it up on a website and it's available. Um, and that's actually been very successful as a strategy. It's one that I certainly would recommend to anyone else that's facing a, an okay. issue of controversy. Thank you. Willie? Yeah, just, just developing that then, is that, is that uh, a model that other organisations who don't do that should adopt? Do you think we should, there should be more proactive publication of information that's there? And even in terms of FOI requests that are sent back to a requester, should that information, where it's appropriate, be made available and published to a wider audience? Sure, there's, um, some organisations do have disclosure logs and local authorities, Murray Council has certainly gone, I think Edinburgh City Council have now as well. Um, so they're a, a good thing. They are a resource in themselves um, because you do have to go back through your request and take out the requester's identity and so on and so forth. There's uh, self-populating disclosure logs in the what do they know? com website which automatically web publishes any response that you send to it um, so anyone else Sheena Brennan February 2018 we started our disclosure log and all of our responses within seven days will be published on the web so MD can actually access them and it's actually been a very useful tool because when you then um, explain to business areas well that response that you we have just published uh, is on the uh, in internet so on that basis why don't we then proactively publish that information go back to your uh, recording of uh, minutes and things like that sometimes it's just about what your appropriate governance route is for your organization uh, and it's about those action logs because you want to make sure that you if someone comes back and questions your decision making at a later stage at least that you have an action log or something to actually have uh, there but when you look at some of the requests the regular requests that you get in that's where we tried to uh, push for the multi-member ward stats to be published because we saw that as a here's a regular request same as uh, expenses a regular request let's publish that because it actually saves the request because you can then point to the information that's already published and it matches up with the information commissioner's model publication scheme which is what their aim is any further comments on that proactive publication Anne um, oh, we want to proactively publish more and where we do proactively publish we find that it can be a useful tool however we also find that um, uh, many of our applicants um, aren't satisfied by what we publish and they want something slightly different. And so we have to therefore um, create bespoke reports for them and provide them with information that is just slightly different or because it's slightly outside the timescales by which the, the exemptions apply. We can't say, well, it's going to be published uh, very shortly. Can you wait for that? And so we end up having to do a lot of work um, outside of the proactive publication um, uh, planned resource, which is very frustrating. Okay. 
I'm going to ask if anyone has anything that they were burning to say today and haven't had the opportunity to say it, to please speak now. Any further points? Okay, can I thank witnesses very much indeed for their evidence this morning. I'm going to suspend briefly for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Item 3 is the Section 23 report on NHS in Scotland 2019. I welcome our witnesses to this morning, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Lee Johnson, Senior Manager, and Fiona Watson, Audit Manager, Performance Audit and Best Value, all from Audit Scotland. Auditor General, can I ask you to make a brief opening statement, please? Thank you, Convener. Today's report is my annual report on the NHS in Scotland, which sets out how the NHS performed in 2018-19, both financially and against national standards. The NHS obviously provides vital health services to the people of Scotland. People are living longer, many with chronic health conditions, and this means that demand for services continues to grow. NHS boards met just two of the eight key waiting time standards in 2018-19, but it is important to note that more people were seen and treated on time compared to 2017-18. Achieving financial sustainability remains a challenge. In 2018-19, four boards needed a total of £65.7 million in additional financial support from the Scottish Government to break even. Half of all NHS savings were non-recurring, and while these savings help the annual position, they don't reduce costs or change services over the longer term. We've also identified several risks in relation to the NHS estate this year. Capital funding has decreased by 63% over the last decade, and backlog maintenance is nearing a billion pounds. High-profile new bills have also come under scrutiny because of health and safety concerns. Despite the financial challenges and rising demand, staff are working hard to provide safe, high-quality care. There's been a significant reduction in mortality rates, and people's reported experience of hospital care is improving. The Scottish Government has taken some steps to help NHS boards address their financial challenges and improve people's access to care. These include a shift from short to medium-term financial planning and the introduction of the Waiting Times Improvement Plan. Health and social care integration continues to be a priority, but while it's essential to future sustainability, progress is too slow. Local audit work has again highlighted a number of challenges that are getting in the way of integrating health and social care. NHS boards struggle to find time to support reform and integration while maintaining their acute services, and this is particularly difficult as demand rises. There's variation in the way NHS boards work with integration authorities to plan services and budgets, and several boards have reported integration authority overspends. Achieving recurring financial balance will only be achieved through whole system service redesign. My report also faces a range of workforce challenges. Shortages are making it difficult to fill key roles in acute and primary care, particularly in rural areas. Agency costs remain high, and plans to withdraw from the EU are likely to exa exacerbate existing pressures. There's also more to do that all, to ensure that all NHS staff are supported in a safe and respectful workplace that helps them to deliver the best care possible. The collaborative leadership, ne leadership needed is made more difficult by high turnover and difficulty in recruiting to senior positions in recent years. The aims of the Government's 2020 vision won't be achieved by next year. NHS boards are working on a significant number of local improvement initiatives, and we're seeing examples of new ways of delivering health care, but it's some distance from the large-scale system-wide reform needed. The challenge for the Government, NHS boards and their partners is to agree new, more focused priorities and create a culture that supports successful partnership working to deliver integrated care. This must include effective leadership involving communities and having clear and robust governance arrangements in place. My report shows that improvements are needed in all these areas. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I are happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. I'm going to ask Anas Sarbar to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, Auditor General, for a um, typically excellent report. I think it captures all the main issues um, that we have around our health and social care sector. Um, you won't be surprised I want to kick off by asking about workforce. Um, quite often our political and public debate is around the, the resource challenges we have in the National Health Service, but I, I genuinely believe the biggest challenge we face is around our, our workforce crisis rather than a, a resource issue. Um, on page 26, Exhibit 11, um, some of the stats are, are laid out. Uh, an increase of by 7.7 per cent in consultant vacancies, meaning we now have over 500 consultant vacancies in the, in the NHS, a 4.9 per cent increase in uh, nursing and midwifery vacancies, meaning we have over 4,000 nursing and midwife vacancies across um, Scotland. We were promised a comprehensive workforce plan by the summer of 2018, but we were then told it was going to come by the summer of 2019, and now it looks like we'll get it at some point, hopefully in 2020. If the government can't deliver a comprehensive plan, how are they actually going to deliver a strategy? 
any sign when we might get it? Um, you're absolutely right that um, planning the workforce is one of the key things needed for um, planning health and care services for the future. Um, more than any other public service, health and care does depend on having the right people with the right skills in the right place to deliver it. Um, that's all the more important when we're talking about changing the way services are provided. And while the demographic um, pressures that I touched on earlier mean there are fewer people to provide services as well as more of us needing them. Um, I think the question for when we'll see the workforce plan is one for government, um, but it has been a recurring recommendation uh, from me in this report and indeed in the work we've done on workforce planning over the last few years. A any idea why it's so delayed given it was promised summer of 2018 and we're now heading to the new year? I think when we Any reported on workforce planning earlier this year, um, we highlighted that the government had changed the way it intended to pull um, the workforce plan together from the different building blocks it had in place. Um, and it is a complex thing to do, um, but I think it's genuinely a question for government rather than us why it's later than planned. And, and you also mentioned in the report culture, and that's partly around the NHS Highland report that was that was done. It's, it's been highlighted time and again around some of the challenges we've seen at the Queen Elizabeth, and I'll ask about that in a, in a, in a moment. You, you mentioned doing the annual survey. Has there been any indication since the publication of the report, perhaps too early, that the government will, will adopt that uh, uh, recommendation around an annual survey and include culture within that uh, survey? Um, it is an issue that we've paid attention to this, this year, partly because of NHS Highland, but partly because of the pressure on staff. Fiona, I wonder if you can give a bit more detail on that. Yes. Uh, when we reviewed the, the staff survey, it was quite clear that whilst that had been done in 19, uh, 2018, uh, it didn't include questions about bullying and harassment. And given the situation um, in Highland, it, we felt it's vital that there's something more regular that uh, boards can use to identify the culture within their organisation. Um, so that's why we made that recommendation. Was that, Fiona Watson, pu purely because of what you saw come out of NHS Highland or through the process of building this year's report? Did you, th did you get more of a sense from right across the board that culture was, was becoming an increasing issue? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, uh, we we heard of other boards that where you know the culture had been an issue. Um, some reports of um, bullying and harassment from other uh, boards as well. Um, so I think it is important that uh, boards understand what the culture is within their organisation and have a cultural improvement program in place uh, to uh, support their staff at all levels. Uh, and just final question on workforce. It clearly looks like the trend is going one way and th there isn't any clear, obvious sign that we're going to see a trend shift the other way any time soon, is there? Um, in, in broad terms, the pressures are, um, as, as you've already described, rising demand um, and demographic pressures also mean there are fewer people to provide the services we need. That really does increase the premium on a workforce plan that sets out what staff are needed, um, how we might train them differently. We've got some examples in the report, for example, in Grampian, where they're really thinking quite hard about the roles of um, doctors, nurses, allied healthcare professionals in flexible ways. All of that becomes more important. Um, at the same time, we're trying to build up services in primary care and in, in the community um, and that workforce plan that covers the whole thing is is critically important it's not going to get easier that's not to say it can't be made better by that sort of fresh thinking and good planning and or you, know, you, you you raised in your opening um, remarks around the the estate and the issues around new bills so just turning to page 18 case study three around the queen elizabeth university hospital uh, clearly we now have uh, uh, in uh, an inquiry being taken place in partnership with the health board and the government being led by Professor Montgomery. We've had the the promise of a of a public inquiry that's still to, still to start in terms of who will who will lead it and what the terms of reference of it, it will be. But clearly, there's an issue around it, not just what's happening once the hospital opened, but actually the handover process, the commissioning process, and what checks were and weren't done. Do you want to say a little bit more about what, what you found through that case study in terms of what you looked at through the audit? I don't think we've got a lot to add at this stage because we haven't seen the results of those, um, the inquiry in Glasgow and the public inquiry in, Ed in Edinburgh. Um, you're right, though, we have seen problems with these two big hospitals. We also saw a couple of years ago significant problems with the um, PFI PPP schools in Edinburgh here. Um, and what we're trying to do in Audit Scotland is to step back from that and look at what some of the common factors might be. 
Um, it's, it's worth um, noting that we have had some very significant new builds that have worked very well. So the new Dumfries Hospital um, was built on time and on budget, and as far as we know, is working as planned um, and providing safe patient care. I think there's something that we're all interested in, in looking at what the differentiating factors are um, and learning from that. Um, that's clearly part of the purpose of the government's announcement of a new centre of excellence for healthcare building. Um, but we're, we're looking at this point in Audit Scotland to see what's known and what the open questions still are. So one of the things I think we'll need to look at is, um, and obviously the, the inquiry will help shape this, but uh, you know, public inquiries can take a long time. Um, it's clear there's an issue around ventilation, there's clearly an issue around uh, water supply, clearly an issue around uh, wider infection control and an inconsistency about what tests were done when, particularly at commissioning stage and then at handover stage and then at opening stage. And I think you can see that quite clearly there's a consistency between what happened in Glasgow and what happened uh, in Edinburgh. Do you think we'll need to look at that problem in more detail and will that be something that you will cover post the, post the inquiry being published? In future audits? Yes, we're actually currently preparing a report on NHS Lothian, just pulling together what's currently known about that hospital, um, drawing on the audit work that was done this year, the reports by KPMG and NSS. Um, and I think within that, it's already clear um, that there are some questions for the public inquiry to examine about the standards and the extent to which they actually are standards rather than guidance, um, about the way in different procurement model models like NPD versus um, public procurements, how um, close that oversight and scrutiny of the construction process is working and then exactly as you say the role of independent testers and whether their role is commonly understood so that everybody knows what's covered. Um, my report won't be able to answer those questions but I hope it will set out what the questions are, what's still unanswered for the public inquiry to be looking at. And, and then just finally um, page 21 exhibit 8 around the um, national trends on the treatment time guarantee. Um, we did get a commitment from the government um, almost a year ago, that they would look at um, the uh, treatment time guarantee and that promise and amend the guarantee so that people were getting more honest uh, assessment of or a more honest response about when they're likely to get that treatment. Uh, is there any indication that the, that, that amendment is is due? Has that come up at all through? through your investigations? Um, I think it's a question for government. I'm not sure there's much we can add for you at this stage. So, Fiona, maybe. I, I understand that there was going to be some interim uh, waiting time uh, results published in October, um, but I haven't seen any. And, and, and just finally within that, Exhibit 8, um, delayed discharge has gone up uh, again um, by 9%, which is quite a stark increase given that we had a promise three years ago to eradicate delayed discharge altogether, um, that, that, that's a very worrying figure indeed in terms of 420,000 bed days lost. That's the equivalent of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, every bed in it, every day for an entire year being lost to delayed discharge. Any explanation around that? Is that more a uh, social cuts side, social care challenge side, or is that more a access point? So is it, is it an entrance problem or an exit problem in terms of the levels of delayed discharge? I'll ask Fiona to come in in a, in a moment, but I think what you're seeing across Exhibit 8 is a real trend of increasing demand uh, because of the ageing population and the um, increase in delayed discharge is part of that. Fiona? Yeah, I think with the, the delayed discharges, it's very difficult for us to understand the reasons. Uh, the data's not explicit in that, that way. Um, it could be that it's uh, problems with uh, internal discharge planning processes, or it could be the lack of step-down facilities in the community. We also picked up in the patient experience survey that the um, the most common delay of discharge for of discharge on the day of common delay of um, discharge delay on the day um, is due to medications waiting for um, medications. So there is a, a sort of there's process problems internally, and then I think the the capacity in the community to look after people. As social care packages not being available. It's difficult for us to tell. We, we don't have that level of information. Um, but what it would indicate is that there's people being stuck in hospital when they could be outside. Thank you. Colin Beatty. Vera, um, I suppose the first thing I should say is that, strangely enough, this 
sounds like a report that's a wee bit better than the ones we've had before. There seems to have been some progress made, despite the fact that there's some areas of uh, obvious concern going forward. Does that, does that sound reasonable? Um, we always try to be fair and balanced in our reports, and we've worked hard in this report to recognise the efforts that are being made. Um, I, I think what we don't want to say is that people aren't working very hard indeed to provide the best possible health and care services, um, and at the same time, the rising demand is making that harder and harder to do. Um, so I'm glad that sense of progress is, being, um, is, is coming through in the report, and the challenges remain really significant. I've got a slight warm glow. Um, but coming back to my old hoary subject of governance, you've obviously raised some issues in regard to that, and paragraph 88 uh, is obviously a concern where you say that NHS boards had adequate governance arrangements, and adequate doesn't fill me with uh, happiness in place, but found recurring areas of concern. So the best you can say about the governance is that it's adequate and that there are current areas of concern. That, that is not terribly good. Again, in paragraph 90, you say results showed that most boards scored themselves as performing well or exceptionally well. This sounds like there's a wee bit of a disconnect there. Perhaps you can give a little bit more information on that. Certainly. Um, as the committee knows, I appoint auditors to every health board in Scotland, and one of the things they're required to do annually is to look at the quality of governance in health boards. Um, as you say, across the piece, the, the feedback that boards received in the reports that go to the boards and to me was that those arrangements were adequate, but auditors highlighted um, room for um, improvement in the capability and capacity of board members, um, the uh, commitment to transparency, which is an issue this committee has um, shown interest in, and the quality and timing of information that boards and committees have available to them. Um, now, in a sense, I think those concerns all reflect the challenges that the health service and health boards are operating under and the, the breadth of responsibilities that boards carry. Um, but it, we are um, all, I think, interested in making sure that boards are as well equipped as possible to manage those pressures, and the things I've just highlighted would help with that. Um, the government has itself... Um, introduced a blueprint for good governance and is requiring boards to report on how well they're doing against it. Um, you're right that at the moment we think boards are probably a bit over-optimistic in their scoring um, and knowing where you are and where there's room for improve is a really important first step. It's something we'll continue to follow up over the years ahead. Has progress on the blueprint for good governance, which is clearly a key, a key step forward, how's progress to date? How, how are we doing on that? Fiona. Well, we are aware that there are three separate working parties um, that the government are um, leading on. Uh, one is around attraction and recruitment, then there's uh, retention and development and corporate governance systems, but we haven't heard any update around the progress of those. Um, one thing that the blueprint uh, does recommend is independent scrutiny in a three-year period, so we would be looking to see that that would be at least commenced in the near future. Well, that was one item I was coming to, which is in paragraph 92, where the blueprint recommends independent validation. And I'm not entirely sure how that's going to take place. We haven't heard how that's going to happen, but assuming that one of these three working parties would be dealing with that. We know that when the blueprint was first published, um, there were sort of peer reviews between um, between boards. So the chair of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde led a review of governance in NHS Highland against the blueprint. Um, that's one model government may be planning to use. But as Fiona said, we don't know whether that is the intention or if there's some other approach to be taken. The mention is made of accountability, and obviously that's a key thing around governance. Are there real concerns about people understanding their accountability in this? Um, I, I would say people probably understand it um, and um, also recognise the, the breadth and scale of things they're accountable for. That's why the information that they're getting becomes so important, to make sure that it does cover the most important factors and that it can be relied on. And this committee spent a lot of time over the last couple of years looking at things that went wrong in Tayside, where, to an extent, board members weren't getting the information they needed and in some places couldn't rely on it. Those are the key things, I think. Now, just, just on that... There's been a huge turnover of senior management, and you've highlighted that under Exhibit 15 in your report. 
What impact do you think that's had? I mean, there's also the question of the, the dual mandates that some people have. And I think that uh, there's several, over half the boards have senior leaders holding dual positions. That seems phenomenally high. I've got no doubt it makes making the changes that are needed harder. Um, we know that it takes a while for any new leader to really understand the challenges they're facing, the team they're working with, the people they're looking to serve. If you've got that degree of turnover and churn, that becomes much harder. Um, and uh, these are big jobs in their own right. If you start asking people to do the same thing in two different boards, that, that adds to the challenge, um, possibly um, exponentially rather than just by adding to it. Yeah, I wonder if you want to say something about what we've seen there. Could, could I just maybe ask there? to comment on, does it actually work? Um, if you've got one person handling two major jobs in parallel, does that actually work? And does it reflect the fact that there's not enough competent people out there in the market? Two parts to that answer. I think it can work in the short term. So we saw um, when NHS Tayside was going through the most significant challenges, a number of its most senior roles were shared with um, NHS Grampian in particular, where effective NHS leaders were asked to take on a dual role while the permanent posts were filled. I reported on NHS Tayside this week and we found some progress there. So it can work as a short term measure. It's not a, a long term um, response and it absolutely does reflect the difficulty in um, finding the number and calibre of people needed to do these, these big significant jobs. Is there any indication that in where there are these dual mandates that there's any deterioration in quality of governance or quality of uh, well, service for the want of a better word? I think it would be hard for us to say we've seen that, um, but it clearly does depend on picking uh, people who are already um, well experienced in their own jobs and have got good systems that can step up for a while while they're carrying both roles and making sure they are short term measures rather than longer term. I think in, in Teesside, as we, our report was published on Tuesday, have now decided to move away from that model uh, to take them to the next level in, in terms of their recovery um, going forward. So they are now looking to recruit a full-time permanent uh, director of finance, whereas they had a dual role previously, because I think they, they think they need that full-time focus on that role. Um, I think our concern around the leadership, as, as the Auditor General has suggested, is um, the, the need for stable leadership to be able to, you know, in our integration report, we talked about collaborative leadership, to build relationships, to be able to um, agree ways forward and um, agree how, how services will be integrated. That takes good relationships and collaborative leadership and that needs stable leaders in place to be able to achieve that. Um, and I think the other things that we've been talking about around culture needs stable, effective leadership to bring about the right culture, the right support of culture. Okay, thank you. Alex Neil. Can I just go back to, first of all, the workforce issue? Um, we do know that a major contributing factor in recent years to the earlier retirement of many more GPs and senior consultants is the pensions issue. Now, there has been some movement, and this is decided at UK level, it's not decided at Scottish level. I know there's been some movement, but the impression I get is that the problem is far from being solved and we're still seeing a large exodus of people in early retirement, for doctors in particular, GPs in particular, from the health service as a result of this pensions fiasco, whereby if they go over a certain level, they're getting taxed at 55% and there's no incentive for them to continue working in the health service, even if they want to. Uh, you, you're right that those pension changes um, affect all high owners and earners in public services, but because of the income distribution, particularly affect doctors, senior GPs and consultants. Um, the UK government has proposed some changes which would give uh, doctors more um, foresight on what their tax affairs were likely to be, rather than getting a surprise tax bill at the end of the year, um, having an indication of what's likely to be coming and being able to apply more flexibility in how they work to um, minimise that additional tax liability. And my understanding is that the doctor's representatives think that doesn't go far enough. 
Um, I think it's too soon to see the impact of that in the figures. Um, I understand the Scottish Government has said it will consider what else it may be able to do to help that, to help that manage that through. But it is absolutely one of the um, pressures in the mix of workforce planning that needs to be properly understood, um, either so it can be mitigated or so that we can be thinking about what that means for the numbers of doctors we train and for doctors' working patterns for the longer term. And this pensions fiasco is causing a bit of a vicious circle because if you take some GP practices, I mean, the average number of GP practices per practice is around five. But if you lose a GP, uh, particularly if you find it difficult to fill the position on a permanent basis, the pressure on the other four uh, it leads them to, you know, maybe retire a bit earlier than they were wanting to and certainly, you know, put stress on them and the, the entire practice. So this seems to be a very, very urgent issue that needs much more dynamic action by the UK government. Uh, I think it is something, as, you, as we said, that um, needs to be properly understood. Um, it's, it has a different impact on different practices depending on the age profile of their GPs and partners particularly, um, but that needs to be well understood. And it's adding to the pattern that we reported on in our report on uh, the primary care workforce, where more doctors coming through training intend to work part-time anyway. So we're needing to train more people to have enough doctors in place to provide the services. This is adding to that pattern. We need to be training more doctors again, and that takes a while to come through. So there's a, a short-term um, um, urgent pressure, as you're describing, but a long-term response that needs to be taken, whatever the, the measures that the UK and the Scottish governments can take on pension And then taxation. more in training is a clear priority. Absolutely. But pensions could be sold quite quickly with the appropriate policy decisions by the Treasury and the Ministry of Health in London and in the negotiations with the doctors. Whereas training, as you say, quite rightly, it takes eight years to get uh, somebody who's ready to be a GP at least eight years. Changes to the tax system could obviously um, be put in place more quickly than, than training doctors. <laughs> um, it's a policy decision rather than one for us, but I think understanding the impact is a really important first step. Yeah. Still on workforce issues, um, in Exhibit 11 on page uh, 26, if you look at the vacancy rates and the staff turnover rates, it certainly gives the impression that we have a regional problem. Um, if you look at the uh, highest consultancy rates, Orkney is by far the biggest. In nursery and midwifery, it's Highland. In allied health professionals, it's Grampian. And in staff turnover, it's Shetland. Um, that suggests to me we have quite a significant and the lowest ones tend to be Central Belt. I mean, Lothian's lowest in one, Ayrshire and and another, and so on. So it seems that the kind of Central Beltish boards um, are finding it easier to find staff to uh, keep t turnover levels reasonably below the average or average, whereas the ones particularly in the north of Scotland, north of the T, basically, um, Grampian, Highland... Shetland, Orkney are all in there uh, as having major workforce problems. So is there a regional dimension to this? That we, in addition to all the things we've been talking about, about pensions and, and training and trainees and all the rest of it, um, there are real problems in particular areas that need very specialised and specifically tailored solutions. Am I right? There is a regional pattern. We think it's primarily remote and rural areas that find it hardest, both because there are fewer people to recruit from and because the way they have to deliver services means it's harder to get cover and therefore the pressures are, are more um, are stronger. Fiona, do you want to add to that? Yes, we certainly find that um, when we looked at the uh, cost of a uh, temporary workforce and the North region was the highest. Uh, there was wide variation across all boards, but certainly that was uh, where the highest spend was and is, um, aligns with that rural need. Um, the problem in Aberdeen in the Grampian mm -hmm. area is just the cost of living and the, you know, and the cost Perhaps. of housing and so on mm -hmm. still, is it? I'm, I'm not sure. Or did you...? No. No. Uh, no. no we, we, Grampian have 
done a lot of work to try and improve recruitment of nurses and we, we mentioned an approach that they took actually um, attracting nurses from Australia. So um, that's one of the strategies that they have adopted. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, in other services such as teaching, the same areas are suffering the difficulty of attracting people into mm -hmm. these areas, the north of Scotland, Highland yeah. and so on. But it seems to be that we need to be doing more in, in terms of specifically tailored solutions in these areas, mm -hmm. in addition to the national stuff. The final question is, I, I think rightly, you make the point that to be sustainable in the long term, there has to be reform, not least having 56, at least 56 boards involved in the delivery of health and social care, excluding the, the local authorities in terms of social care. Uh, if you add them in, you're talking about 88 boards involved in the delivery of health and social care in Scotland. It seems to me that's one area where there needs to be reform, streamlining of the number of organisations um, who are tripping over each other, it seems to me, with a lot of overhead that might be better spent on the front line. Uh, a, do you agree with that? And B, when you say the need for reform, what would be the top three areas that you reckon would have the most impact in terms of the reform needed to make the health and social care system sustainable in the long term? Uh, there's a lot in that question. Um, first of all, on the number of bodies involved. Um, I said before that um, the, the structure of the NHS is a matter for government, but having that many bodies involved is certainly making it harder to recruit and retain the number of high-caliber managers, leaders that we need to do that, and I think we're seeing this here. Um, and that we, we aren't seeing those boards yet having the impact that they should be having in really providing collaborative leadership that starts to shift care and develop new services in primary and community settings that would reduce the pressure on acute hospitals. Um, so that, that seems to me one of the clear messages coming out of our work in health and care. Top three things. Um, we say in the report, and we give a number of examples, there are some really good things happening out there. Um, we talk about some of the examples where the ambulance service NHS 24 are working to um, really understand better the needs of individuals and respond more quickly to it. Um, NHS 24 triaging people looking for urgent appointments with their GPs, uh, very high levels of patient satisfaction and clearly directing people to better, more appropriate services. Other examples in the report too, but they remain quite quite isolated examples and we need to get better at both <coughs> evaluating, identifying what works and rolling it out more quickly. Secondly, I think the workforce plan that we've been talking about here, unless we've got the right people in the right places, we're not going to be able to, to build those services and really shift away from an unhealthy reliance on acute care to something that's better for an ageing population. The third thing I think is linked to the government's development of its next strategy after the 2020 vision, um, making sure that that is prioritised, but really engaging properly with people in line with the principles in the Community Empowerment Act and the PLACE framework to get people at a local level involved um, engaged in discussions about what their health services might look like in the future. So we're moving away from a conversation that's about what we're closing, closing hospitals or beds, to something about developing better alternatives. They'd be my top three. Okay. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning. Um, your report, I'd like to look at capital funding. Uh, so you have a section in your report at page 16 uh, on this, you say that the capital funding from the Scottish Government has decreased by 63% over the last 10 years. Uh, and there's, I think in your opening statement, Auditor General, you talked about uh, around a billion pounds worth of backlog maintenance. Now, your report talks about a national strategy being developed uh, to address this. Uh, but given that none of these, the capital funding issue is not new, uh, are you able to give us any guidance on when this strategy might be completed? And to go back to a question on Asarwa asked in a different context, why is this taking so long? Um, I'm not sure we can tell you very much more than we say in the report. Um, we know the government is working on a uh, national capital investment strategy. Um, I welcome that. I think it's really important. We do have a picture, first of all, of how, the, how well the capital that's available matches the needs that are out there. And secondly, making sure that it is being prioritised so that we are investing where that's needed in uh, new community health centres, um, new types of uh, provision closer to people's homes. The question
question as to why it's not published yet, I think, is one for government. I'm not sure we can add much to what we say in the report. Grant, uh, it just uh, very briefly, arising from that, do you have any idea when they started developing this strategy? No, no, I think it's a question for government. I shall ask. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, Anas Sarwar also uh, raised certain delays uh, that have come about with new assets uh, and new facilities. Now, whenever there are such delays, that can mean that an older site needs to be operational for longer than perhaps intended uh, and perhaps is ideal. Uh, logically, that will result in additional expenditure and additional overhead and potentially compromises to safety. Uh, so that being the case, are you reassured from the NHS, the relevant board, uh, and from Scottish Government that any risk to patient and staff safety have been addressed, uh, the risk uh, flagged, and that the NHS has sufficient funds to continue to operate these older facilities safely? Obviously, the most significant example of what you're describing is the delay in opening the new Sick Children's Hospital here in Edinburgh. Um, we're preparing a report on that at the moment to set out the costs that are associated at the moment, um, the delays and what's known about the causes of those delays. I think in that instance, um, my judgment at this point is that the government has been very clear about what the additional costs are and what investments are needed to keep the uh, safety of the existing services um, at Sheen's here and the um, neurological centre um, operating safely during the period that they're expected to be needed for. Um, I, I, my overall sense in this report, um, my overall message, is that government is always focused on maintaining safety as far as it, it can do that. I don't want to ring alarm bells about it. The concern is that the, the investment required and the time that it takes is, again, distracting from really making the sorts of changes that are needed to make the NHS sustainable for all of us for the future. I'm grateful, thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank very much, Convener. Auditor General, you've uh, told us in the report you know, that funding is up year and year in cash and real terms, almost for nine years now. Headcount is up five years in a row. The standard of care is high. Public satisfaction is high. And there's always a but. The <laughs> uh, whole service takes about 42% of the entire Scottish budget. And I firstly thank Alec for asking the question I was going to ask about where the opportunities are, the greatest opportunities for improvement are. So I could have maybe change it a little and say, what evidence have you seen since last year's report where the improvements are, are, are occurring greatest? Um, I referred in my answer to Mr Neil's question about the examples through the report, so I won't repeat that. Um, I'd, I'd highlight three things that are sort of system-wide that are improvements. First of all, we've got the medium-term financial framework, which I think is, um, is very helpful in setting out the scale of the financial challenge and requiring boards for the first time to prepare and publish longer-term financial plans. Um, we have seen the Waiting Times Improvement Programme, which I think is, a, is helpful as a short-term um, investment to um, bring waiting time, times in line with public expectation while thinking about what's needed system-wide to um, invest in primary and community-based services. And thirdly, the work that's going on around leadership development, because I think without strong leadership, we're not going to be able to do what's required here. These are difficult jobs. Um, it's hard to recruit and retain people, and we need to support the people who are there. I think that investment in leadership is also a positive. But are, are they yielding fruit? Are, they, are, they, are we getting the benefit of these initiatives? Can you see the benefits and improvements taking place as a result of these changes? It, it's early days, as we say in the report. Um, I, the, they are all things that will take a while to really be able to demonstrate the impact. They're all good first steps, and I'm happy to give them that, that credit in the report and here in committee. And I think it's too soon to say what, what impact they're having. Uh -huh. And uh, I wonder if I could turn to Ayrshire and Arran. You've included a case study on page 16 where you mention NHS Ayrshire and Arran. And of course, you've reminded us that uh, they had to make savings of about £23.8 million last year. But due to certain initiatives that, that went on down there, and I think you've identified 143 improvement initiatives that were identified giving us recurring savings in your report there of 18.4 million. And I think that's that's really good and it's impressive and I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted that Ayrshire and Arne are achieving this. But can you see whatever's happening there 
being extended elsewhere to, to give us a, a chance, an opportunity to get the kind of recurring savings that we need, we need but that don't impact or diminish the health service that we rely on. I think that's a really interesting question, Mr Coffey. We've included um, the update on H NHS Ayrshire and Aaron here because it is making the sorts of progress that you've described, not out of the woods yet, but real progress. Um, I think it's fair to say the government has tried to take a similar approach in other boards, providing support to NHS Highland and NHS Tayside, where they're finding it much more difficult to really start to turn the situation around. Um, I'm not sure we know why that's the case. I'll ask the team in a moment if there's anything that we want to add, but I think it would be um, very interesting to explore with government what they think has made a difference here. Fiona, do you want to...? Yes, so the, um, the, re the non-recurring savings um, versus recurring savings was at 50%, which was the same as last year, so we haven't seen um, any improvement in recurring savings per se um, and boards classify their savings as high medium or low depending on how they believe they'll achieve them um, what we've seen is um, that 32 percent of the the savings were classified as high risk in 1819 which was up from 13 percent the year before so what that would tell us is that there's a sort of lack of confidence in in meeting those more challenging uh, savings um, and you know by the end of the financial year um, so I think that's th there's lots of cross pressures and demand pressures in working in that traditional model of care and, and this is where the the sort of impetus is required to to have that whole of transformation whole of service transformation um, to actually uh, look at those more cost-effective options of out-of-hospital, um, out-of-acute care. Mm. And what about the impact of these savings on the quality and standard of care? Is anyone looking at that just to make sure we're, we're, we're not d diminishing the standard and quality of care? Are, we look, are you looking at that or is, do we expect the health boards to do that as well? Yeah, well, the health boards will be looking at that themselves. Um, we had a, a, a look at the NHS Performs um, website and there was quite uh, an assortment of, of positive results around improvements in uh, quality and safety. Uh, there's particular improvements in hospital um, mortality rates reducing and also infection rates. So. There, there didn't seem to be any impact, um, sh you know, showing around quality of care, and I guess that's testimony to the, the staff that are working hard in the services. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Um, thank you. If I can just continue, perhaps, on the non-recurring savings. I mean, you were speaking about 50%, but in your 2017 report, you said 35% was unsustainable, and it's now up to, what, I think you said, two years of of 50 per cent. Mean, what steps are the health boards of the Scottish Government doing to actually address this? Um, I, I think the first step is the longer term financial planning. That uh, we, We've got the um, Scotland-wide national medium term financial framework and beneath that um, three year plans from individual health boards setting out how they expect to be able to um, balance their books and transform their services. Um, within that they are um, getting better, I think, at identifying which savings are recurring and which are non-recurring and which are the most and least likely to be achieved and to manage the work there. Um, there is something important, though, about um, moving beyond simply making savings to really thinking about how the uh, priorities within the medium-term financial framework about taking half of those savings and reinvesting them in primary and community services um, is being achieved. That's where the real prize is, not just in balancing the books, but in using the headroom that creates to shift the system. Um, we're seeing some improvements. I think the government is now supporting boards to make their plans more robust and more detailed so that they and we can use them um, as more helpful tools, but it's all work in progress. Does that mean that if, um, let's say, the budget is eased, they will just not look for savings? Um, my um, judgment in this report, I think, is that the pressures aren't going to ease because of the demographic pressures we're seeing. Um, the overall national uh, financial framework identifies a gap of 1.8 billion by 2024. Unless um, this change happens, um, that is only likely to move in one direction, I think, without the sorts of transformation we're talking about. Yeah, but you also mentioned here an issue that's come up in other areas, that there are different ways that the boards measure their likelihood of savings 
And then you also mentioned, you've spoken about the three-year plan, that not everybody is doing it, not everybody is putting the information into their accounts. Now, as I say, we had this, I think, in some of the colleges. That's right. Can the government not actually get people to do their accounts properly? Um, this isn't about the accounts, it is about the, the future plans that they've got. Um, you're absolutely right. We think that any um, savings which haven't been identified clearly at the start of the year should be identified as high risk. Um, and we talk in paragraph 27 about the work the government is doing with boards to um, help them, to um, support them in making sure their plans are properly detailed and are prepared on a consistent basis. Um, I welcome that and we'll be looking to see at what effect it has in future. But when you say it's not the accounts, it's still information that's financial information being prepared, so it Absolutely. should be done to the same? I, I think so, yes. So you think we should address this with the government? I, I, think, I think making sure that the plans are robust and consistent and that people are able to deliver them is key to um, making these savings that can be reinvested elsewhere. So I, I but the reporting the of them is a simple it. part, isn't it? That yeah, the, the, the planning of them do. is the first part and they should be consistent, no question about it. Do members have any further questions for the Auditor General and her team? Okay. Can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence? I now close the public part of this meeting as the committee moves into private session. <laughs>